Each week on this program, Jeff and his guests share their expertise, personal anecdotes, and the latest industry news to keep you in the loop. Now to provide you with insight and help you navigate the consistently changing world of real estate lending, here is your host for The Mortgage Voice, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I am Jeff Barton, and this is The Mortgage Voice. Thanks very much for tuning into the show and coming to us each and every week. Coming to you from our studios out here in Ventura County. I know you're in San Bernardino, Riverside Counties, KCAA, and all the friends that are out there at that particular station bringing us to you. Appreciate you listening, driving around either on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon when the show comes to you. It was a busy week, as always is a busy week, and some of the pressures and the stresses that exist this time of the year have uh, really um, been helped along a little bit by making it less some of the news coming out of both the rates that people are charging for mortgages, that's been good news. Uh, some of the recent levels of housing availability is also good news, and so we just want to get into that. I want to ask if you can or do want to ever see the show, you can go to YouTube, Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice on YouTube. This episode will be up this week and the many, many, many hundreds of episodes that have been there since we've been starting. Well, we started putting them on YouTube about six, seven years ago. And uh, you can see the progression of what goes on in the mortgage industry, what happens to loans, loans, products, how we get to decide who gets a loan and who doesn't get a loan, credit score, all kinds of different things that are on there that stay fresh, stay green, even though the topical front end of the show may be old. Certainly a lot of the back end is relevant. So hang in there and see and listen to what you want to. But certainly if you want to go to the archive and hear what you can, uh, that also helps in terms of your education. Because when, hey, let's face it, when you go out and you want to get a loan, you want to talk the most educated way that you possibly can, listening to the show each and every week will give you some of that education. And, this, and of course, out there in the marketplace where the products change almost every month, uh, and since the mortgage rates have gone up, Lending has tightened, and we have seen different types of products, whether they be QM or non-QM, whether it be FHA, government loans, or whether they be the hard money type. These products and how much they cost you, yes, they change all the time. So again, I'm Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice, and welcome to the show. Okay, uh, driving over uh, to the studio with myself and Daryl recording, as I say, out here in Ventura County. Just, just thinking, thinking about, about uh, what, what is happening this time of year in December. Obviously, we have wars going on around the world, which affects people's psyche as well as their wallets. Um, and you may, may or may not know this, but uh, the U.S. deficit is now $32 trillion dollars. Uh, and why I say that, why I bring that up, because it coincides quite nicely with uh, the credit card debt in the U.S. and how much uh, of it there is. Apparently, the credit card um, machines have been operating uh, nonstop uh, since the COVID money, COVID relief money has run out. Uh, people have not stopped their spending habits, and we now have about $1.1 trillion in credit card debt. debt. Not great. Uh, as we see debt climb in the credit card world, we wonder where and how this amount of money is going to be paid off, and um, if we're actually going to be able to see some sort of relief to those people in any other way, like a new job, uh, increasing money in their salaries, uh, maybe have to pick up a second job. This is the time of the year where people spend money, spend a lot of money, and usually it's money off their credit cards, so that number of $1.1 trillion in credit card debt nationally is going to increase. Not a good sign, not a good thing. If you're out there and you're looking to buy a home, the, the last thing you want to have is a bunch of credit card debt. Um, piling up so that the underwriter sees, hey, look, these people have way too much credit card debt, and it lessens the amount that you can afford to buy. Usually in a situation like a purchase, you have to pay off some of these credit cards to up your credit score. We're not even talking about that portion of the equation, just talking about the actual debt itself. The more money you have to pay towards either minimums or paying down that credit card debt, the less money you have to afford to that house. And because rates have dropped from a high of 8.5% down to 7%, maybe even a little lower, that money is directly affecting how much you can afford on your mortgage. So more into credit cards, 
less into uh, your mortgage. And because the rates the way they are today, that's actually going to go a, long, a lot longer, a lot farther. I mean, $100 a month may not seem like a lot, but it is when it comes to lowering the uh, amount of interest that you pay on your credit, on your uh, mortgage interest rate. Uh, as I said, well, let's just get into it right now. Uh, the interest rate on a 30-year fixed rate today, 7.9%. A 15 years at 6.50. The FHA is at 6.43. That's a smoking deal right there, although you do have the um, MIP, the mortgage insurance premium, it's still 6.43%. Uh, that's doing something. If we can get the 30 year fixed rate down there, we're going to see a, another housing boom. And as I said, good thing is we've seen an uptick in listings uh, as we go through this particular holiday season. Uh, 7.55 is the jumbo. 6.65 is the 5-1 arm. The two years at 4.72 and the 10 years at 4.23. Now we've seen uh, that these two numbers, the two and the 10 year, have, have gone up just a little bit in the last week, but they have been falling steadily. I mean, we had the two year over 5.25% not three weeks ago. Uh, same with the 10 was Flirting with five would occasionally go over five percent, but now we're talking. Hey, look, we're almost back down to four and a quarter percent and four point seven two percent, respectively, for the ten and the two. That's pretty good. And what that tells you is that the demand on treasuries is up, which means that there are other areas that you know they're not making the same kind of money. So uh, people flood to treasuries. They flood to treasuries in times of uh, trouble around the world. And they come to treasuries when they're looking for a fixed long term when there is some volatility either in the stock market or in world events. Now, what we've seen, as I said, uh, there's a bunch of good news, uh, that being one of them, interest rates are down. Uh, the other one is that listings are up, as I said. Both of those things mean that the housing market is, is going to look better uh, entering 2024, uh, where you know, a uh, third of the way through the month, so that is coming quicker than later. And obviously, between the holidays, nobody's working. And usually, about a week before the holidays, everybody starts to gear it down, at least in the, the lending business. So that gives you about, I don't know, five, six, seven days left uh, to be able to accomplish what you want to accomplish. If it's going out and shopping for a house, I'd do it this weekend. It's a great weekend to get out there. Weather's changed. Um, People are, are not that paying, paying not that close attention to what the housing market is doing. You just might find that bargain, that uh, diamond in the rough out there that you've been looking for. And because, as I say, the uh, mortgage interest rates are lower, this is a great time to get out there. Okay. Another thing that came up this week with the jobs report. Jobs report usually means that, um, you know, this time of year we do see uh, holiday jobs. We do see people, you know, obviously out there trying to... Uh, work uh, so they can pay for all these holiday gifts that they've got. <laughs> However, jobs report today was great. Great news for a lot of different reasons. Uh, unemployment rate, 3.7% down from 3.9% in November. 3.5% is supposedly uh, full employment, but uh, we're very darn close to it. Uh, the jobs added in November, 199,000, according to the uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics, up from 150,000 in October. Everybody was saying, oh, wow, we're going to get that re that recession. We're going to see the, um, uh, the employment rate uh, go up. We're going to see people stop being hired. We're going to see that huge opening of jobs that are out there uh, decrease. Well, that didn't happen. Actually, the number of jobs that were... Uh, employed, the number of people that uh, hired last month went up to 199,000, and that's really up about 50,000 from the month before. That's a lot, okay? Uh, also, wages rose 0.4%, 4.1% uh, year over year. That's still good, and as we have stated earlier in, in different shows, I don't know, going back three, four, five months when inflation was really high. You would see job uh, wage growth, but what, what the problem was is that you had regular inflation outpacing wage growth. So really you had negative, uh, net negative. Well, now we've got inflation 
probably down about 3 3.1 percent on a year over year basis well if we have wages outstripping them by you know 1.1 percent that means that your buying power increases as as your wages increase as inflation gets more under control and that's a great thing anyway I'm Jeff Barton your voice in the mortgage industry uh, glad you could join us and we'll be right back you're listening to the mortgage voice with Jeff Barton We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to the Mortgage Boys with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show. Each and every week we come to you, we bring to you not only guests from around the country, around the different industry positions that we have, but we also talk about uh, some of the macro things going on that might affect your decision-making process, how you want to look at getting a loan, whether it's uh, you know something that is, is so outrageous and uh, egregious in your life that you just can't get to it. Some of the questions that you may have just fall by the wayside when you're in that type of emotion. So we try to bring it together by providing you with information about what's really going on and at the same time try to do it in a lighthearted, humorous way. Anyway, if you want to see this show, you can go to YouTube, Jeff, Jeff Barton, The Mortgage Voice on YouTube. And if you want to um, go to, let's see, our, our uh, website. What's our website? Uh, TheMortgageVoice.com. TheMortgageVoice.com. Excellent. If you want to see and hear both the interviews as well as uh, number and how to get in touch with the guests, you can go to the, uh, TheMortgageVoice.com. Uh, with us today, and I'm very happy to have Jessica with us, um, Compliance is one of those things that we talk about uh, not a lot on the show. And, and one of the things that I wanted Jessica, and Jessica Johnson joins us now. She is a compliance officer, the compliance officer for Searchlight Lending up uh, in Southern California, up really all over the place. Isn't that right, Jessica? That's right. Yep. We're all 50 states. Oh, excellent. Okay, so one of the reasons compliance that we want to talk about it today, it's year-end. People are nervous. They, you know... Doing, doing things that, that might get you in trouble is one of the reasons compliance exists. Uh, we all remember 2008, and as I remember, uh, that was a terrible time for a lot of people who lost their homes. Uh, Jessica, why don't you describe a little bit about what your job does and how your daily uh, activities uh, take you to really looking over all the files and all aspects of any company? Sure. So I work with all aspects of a, a mortgage business, and I work to not only protect you know, the public, but also loan officers and broker owners um, so that everything that they're doing, every action that they're taking or making is going to be in the best interest of the borrower always. Um, I think one of the one of the biggest things that I do is review files um, at closing uh, just to make sure that all disclosures came in correctly, um, all, you know, the borrower was aware of all things throughout the loan and um, that the borrower signed off correctly on all items, um, and which is, again, a protection for both the loan officer, uh, the office itself, and um, the borrower. So, um, And then also, you know, we deal with licensing and making sure that licensing questions are answered. Uh, that can be difficult to navigate. As you mentioned, since 2008, we've had a, a ton of changes in the industry as far as compliance goes. Um, and so navigating our, you know, our licensing registry system today can be a little bit confusing. So I try to make it easy, as easy as possible for loan officers to, you know, make sure they're licensed correctly and, and doing um, the right activities in the right states. So. How much has technology changed over the last, I don't know, five or ten years to make your job either easier or harder? I think the technology has made life a lot easier in the compliance realm with okay. everything, almost everything, being electronic. Mm -hmm. uh, that means it's all at our fingertips. So if we need a document signed real quick, you know, we can flip it right over, get it done, and, and get it back in. Um, so compliance isn't this kind of daunting thing anymore that's going to take so much time away from what a, a, you know, a loan officer really wants to be doing, which is, you know, helping borrowers out with their mortgages. So I think technology has come a long way, and it's made compliance access to be at our fingertips, which 
has helped the industry a lot. What is what what are the, some of the uh, problems that you see on files that come in that need fixing or repair or some attention from either the loan officer or the borrower that may not be so well known by the general public? Yeah, I think the biggest thing that I see is a missed signature okay. um, somewhere along the lines, and it's a it's very easy to fix. Um, a lot of times it's almost in duplicate. The borrower has seen the document or understands the document already, and we just really need, you know, a signature to be completed or something to be acknowledged. Um, that's probably the biggest hiccup that I see, and the other is just uh, loan officers not really knowing, um, you know, where they need to be licensed in order to do, you know, loan activities. Um, or how to get that done. So those are the two major things on, on both those sides. Now, with AI, everybody has touted the, you know, the unbelievable savings and um, efficiencies that AI can bring to the industry. Obviously, it's going to affect the mortgage industry, but do you think that clever borrowers are going to be using AI with which to falsify documentation? I think so. I think that's going to be a big deal. I also think wire fraud yep. is going to be... Pre more, even more prevalent than it already is. Um, it is, truthfully, it, it's one of those things, just like any technology that comes along, it's a double-edged sword. And I think uh, the AI is going to end up causing some major issues um, for us, and it's just going to, you know, I'm sure we're going to have a technology developed that's going to kind of counteract you know, and allow more security in the future. You know, I, I always worry about new technologies, and um, one of the newer technologies, actually it's not that new, but it's new enough, uh, Bitcoin. Have you had a yes. chance to work with Bitcoin in purchases or in refis? Not so much. You know, some of the lenders for a long time were so hesitant right. to even look at Bitcoin, right, as a as a usable asset. Um, we've done it here and there, a few. Um, so it is getting better. But I'll be honest, I think I think the lenders still are not 100% there with understanding that it's a viable option for, you know, assets or reserves. But um, I think they're getting there. They're just not, they're just not as open. Yeah, I agree. I, I I've always shied away. And early on, when uh, maybe four or five years ago, we had a bunch of guests come on and try to explain exactly what Bitcoin is, what it is. Yeah. And uh, I couldn't get a similar answer from two people in a row. And some people were more interested in the investment quality of it rather than the actual quality of it. So I was all, I always shied away from it in in any business just because I didn't know what it was. Yeah. No, I completely agree. And. I, I mean, I think that's what's happening with AI right now. Also, right. if you people are shying away from using it, but it can be a really helpful tool tool in their businesses. How do you um, use it? But it it's going to cost. You can. I think the biggest way that loan officers can be using it is in marketing. Right. Um, right. You know, really tailoring their marketing to uh, those borrowers out there just based on AI, that's going to be a big, big thing coming in the next couple of years. Okay. So you know about the do not call list, of course, you know about the, you know, do not yes. text, do not email, whatever these lists are and that they exist and that you have to stay up with it, whether it's a UDP or whether it's, you know, the state issued lists. What is the new, um, I don't want to be bothered by AI. I mean, does AI have its own special category of, of how it works, operates and contacts the borrowers or potential borrowers? I think it's come onto the scene so quickly that there really hasn't been anything yet. Um, I think we'll definitely see that coming, but I think for now it's just going to fall into the category the same as the do not call list, do not, you know, unsubscribe from email or marketing, you know, uh, materials coming over emails, things like that. Do you see technology itself? I know you're... You know, you've got, you've got a family, and you're, you're busy, and you probably have to share both business and, you know, when you're with your family, so i.e., i got to pick up a phone call, i got to answer a text. Do you see that particular aspect getting more intense, especially around the holiday season when people are already intense? Yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, it is it, – it tends to become a little more um, – intense with everything but right. again i think the technology is going to help with that in the future okay. um 
And it's specifically AI, you know, you can actually respond to somebody's text message, you know, you can have it set up to respond to somebody's text message without even typing in the words, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I think, I think it'll make things easier in the future, but for right now, I mean, I'm still, you are kind of talking to the wrong person because I also still, I, I love a good pencil and paper list. Ah, uh, me too. I, <laughs> me too. I'm old school. I'm old, but I'm old school yeah. too. <laughs> yeah, I know. I love technology, but at the same time, I'm not. I'm not walking around the grocery store with my cell phone trying to figure out what I put on there. Yeah, no, I agree. Listen, Jessica, I appreciate you coming on the show. I want to have you back because always talking about this is a good thing and to get people aware of of, of exactly how the loan process works. Always lightens up uh, what they're particular like. What are they doing with my loan? Well, there's a lot of things to do, and this is just one part of it. So I want to thank you for coming on, give you a chance, if you'd like, to leave a, a way by which they, people can get in touch with you or, um, you know, however you want. Absolutely. Yeah, I appreciate you so much having me on. Sure. Um, it's always great to talk about these topics. I think what you're doing is, is really good and important. Okay. Um, people can always reach me, compliant, via email at compliance at searchlightlending.com or uh, via telephone at 949-632-9549. Excellent. Jessica, thank you very, very much for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Have a good one. And you too. That's Jessica Johnson from Searchlight Lending. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to the Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show each and every week. We come to you, we bring you solutions. We talk about what's going on in the real estate and the mortgage industry, and um, I really appreciate you doing that. San Bernardino and Riverside broadcast areas for our station, KCAA. We've been with them for a long, long time. Uh, they carry that signal all the way to Palm Springs, some parts of L.A., and certainly some parts of Orange County as well. So welcome to the show. If you've missed the first couple of sections, that's okay. We have plenty left in the show. Uh, we've been talking about... Uh, what's going on in the uh, rates? Rates have come down. That's a good thing. Anybody who doesn't think that's a good thing is probably not in uh, the hunt for a house. Uh, most people who don't really follow the mortgage industry or the mortgage rates uh, really are not that aware, but rates, as everybody who is shopping for a house knows, have been crazy high. They went up to 8.45% eight uh, on a 30-year fix, oh, about three months ago. Well, right now, we are down about 7%, so coming down uh, one and a half percentage points over the last couple, three months, certainly the last three weeks, is really welcome news in the housing game because those dollars that you save on your interest rate can be put into directly buying a bigger, a better, a better house than you would have been able to had the rates not come down. Now, the other question in the house buying business is, will prices on houses come down? Well, one of the things that makes that happen is the old supply and demand curve. We've seen a supply increase, not a huge supply increase, but a supply increase nonetheless. Now, some people say that they bought the house. Everybody's got the person that they know who says, oh, you know what, Christmas Eve I bought that house and I got a great deal. And, you know, uh, yes, I've heard that too. But this year it may actually be true. Uh, if we have a number of houses coming on the market or an increase in supply and we have lowering of the interest rate on your mortgage, you might be able to get a pretty good savings both on the cost of your house as well as the cost of your mortgage. Now, that's a pretty good present this time of year. And if you're out there right now and listening, um, maybe dust off that old list of uh, houses that you wanted to see in July, see if they're still around. If they are, uh, maybe this is a good time to go over there, take a look again, and make an offer. All these prices that we're talking about, all this money that uh, uh, you may or may not have to put in is um, offset by the number of programs in the marketplace. Uh, uh, certainly if you go non-QM, it's going to cost you a little bit more, but your options are also greater. Uh, if you go FHA, it may cost you a little bit more, but the actual rate of your loan is going to be the lowest of all the major 30-year to 
5-1 arm, that 6.43 for FHA is pretty low rate. Uh, You may have to pay some mortgage insurance premium, but uh, the overall rate on your loan is lower, so it's an offset. And again, it's insured. So if you do get into trouble, you do lose your job, something happens. You know that that insurance that you've been paying uh, will pick up the slack if, in fact, you have to default on the loan and pay the loan off. So that's a good thing as well. It's always, you know, people always say, hey, you know what, why am I paying that? It's too expensive. Well, some borrowers who aren't quite sure do get into an FHA loan, get into trouble and can't pay it back, but the insurance that you have does pay it back, does pay it off. So that's a comfort for a lot of people knowing that as they're struggling to try to put it together, keep it together, get everybody in the house to contribute, if it just doesn't make it and there is a foreclosure, you have the backstop of the insurance, and that is a good thing for many, many borrowers, which is why FHA that, and you only have to put 3.5% down as a down payment. These loan options, the options that we're talking about in this particular month in December, are all things based on what we're talking about, increased rate, lowering of the mortgage, um, yeah, the, the mortgage bill. These are good things, and these things that you really can, you know, work on to be able to get a house, maybe in December. Maybe that's the greatest present of all this year. Okay, let's get to a few more things in the news to use section, because there are a bunch of news things. Uh, we track GDP. And there is a website, whether it's Housing Wire, whether it's Mortgage News Daily, whether it's uh, I go to usually MSN or I go to Yahoo or I go to some generic uh, website uh, browser in order to use uh, their finance or money, you know, clickable uh, to go and see what's happening. And all these sites together, uh, one of them has what we track as the GDP on a on a quarterly basis. And so we we I'll bring that to you now. And uh, there's three different three different entities that bring you the GDP estimate. One is the Bank of America, and they say that the fourth quarter estimate will be 1%. Now, you might remember, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, but 4.9% was GD, the actual uh, gross domestic product in the third quarter, really humming along. In the fourth quarter, it has cooled, and everybody knows because, you know, we saw uh, employment Unemployment rather tick up. We saw hiring um, uh, tick down a little bit. We saw the the number of jobs available uh, tick down. Now this month is an anomaly. Obviously, I talked about in an earlier segment that the uh, uh, number of jobs uh, that were created and uh, number of people that got hired this month 199,000. That's a lot. Um, we see the uh, unemployment rate 3.7 percent. Uh, that's a little. Uh, that's almost full employment, but. The GDP tracking, yes, 1% is not great in the fourth quarter, but if you average it out over the year, we're probably going to get to be anywhere between 2 and 2.5% two and on a yearly. Okay, Goldman Sachs, 1.4%. That's their estimate, uh, and we are almost at the end, so there is some good data in there to indicate where we are, whether we get that famous Christmas rally in the stock market or not. Um, the Atlanta Fed, which is the one I look towards the most because they seem to me uh, to be the most conservative, but uh, here they're kind of right in the middle of Bank of America and Goldman. They're at 1.2 percent as, as uh, what could gross domestic product will be in the fourth quarter. Um, all these things are pointing to a pretty good year in 23. So why are people so down? Why are people so upset? Well, the main reason is, and I've always called uh, this part of the inflation equation something that's, that's a, a greed-driven thing, um, the inflation was 9%. Prices rose 9%. But if you continue through the year, year and a half, even today, uh, that prices are beyond the 2% target rate that the Fed has targeted, you'll see that we're up around 16 17% for the last two years in terms of some products, some pricing out there. Now, we are seeing something called disinflation. I read an article today about it, meaning that prices will drop below what their current levels are, not just inflate lower, but actually drop below. Now, there's some 
issues with that as well in an economy if you have disinflation. To me, it would be better if we just had greedy people stop being greedy and go back to pricing whereby uh, uh, it, it demands your profit margin, whatever that is. I believe many of these companies have increased their profit margins, whether they hide it in salary, whether they hide it in, in uh, stock buybacks, whether they hide, hide it in dividends. I think that's a lot of what these people have done because, as we've seen, the supply chain issues solved. Uh, and you haven't even heard. When was the last time you heard somebody say, oh, the prices are so high because all our products are stuck in China or they're stuck on a ship or nobody's at the ports to unload? Haven't heard that. Haven't heard that for a long, long time. And that's a, it's a great thing that you haven't heard that. But the excuse that that was the reason for inflation is wrong. It shouldn't be used now, and prices should actually revert. Because if you have supply back, if you have no delays in bringing things to the market, and if you have trade in balance as it has been, not in balance as the uh, balance of payments, no. Obviously, well, the U.S. is is way behind in a lot of that, which is okay. I mean, if you can uh, buy it, you buy it, you make it, you ship it out, or you buy it and consume it here. That's why the trade balance is so different in most countries uh, than it is here in the U.S. The U.S. buys stuff, makes it, and consumes it. Most countries buy stuff, make it, and ship it out. That's the balance of trade. Anyway, all of these things being what they are, um, I think the, uh, what's happening uh, for us here, both inflation-wise, that's a good thing. We have to have the greed machine reverse itself a little bit, even though disinflation they say is bad. Uh, all of these things, interesting, very interesting. Um, okay, a couple things that we get in the Michigan Sentiment Survey. That Michigan Sentiment Survey we talk about each and every month. On inflation, 3.1%. And that's down from 3.3% last month. Uh, and the reason is the gas is cheaper and the solid jobs report. Okay, also the consumer sentiment uh, is up 8 points to 69.4. Uh, just for you political buffs, anything below 90% on the uh, political consumer sentiment means, uh, means not good things for the incumbent president. There's a year left. We'll see what happens. I'm Jeff Martin, your voice in the mortgage industry. We'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show, for listening to us each and every week as we try to help you make decisions about your real estate and mortgage needs. Now, that's a mouthful right there because this time of year, there are so many things that can get in front of you and all the things that you want to do about your living situation. Well, it could be a good time to get out there and look for mortgages and look for housing. Housing has increased a little bit, and mortgage rates have really come down about a point and a half from their highs. So this is a good time to save a little money and maybe get yourself a bargain. But I'm not the expert in those fields. I bring Connie Hernandez back to the show as she is the expert uh, out in the San Bernardino Riverside area. She's in West Covina. Connie, how are you? Fine, Jeff. How are you doing? I'm fine, thank you. Okay, you heard a little bit of an introduction. What do you think? What's going on in the market out there? Are you seeing what I'm seeing? A little bit of a, uh, more housing uh, on the market and less cost to the mortgages? Less cost to the mortgages, meaning your the interest rates dropped a tad? Yes, <laughs> yes, absolutely. Yes, it is. Absolutely. And I, I say that lightly, a tad, because, you know, obviously... <laughs> It would take more than what they've dropped to really bring or bounce back the market as far as buyers sure. are concerned. But um, it definitely does help. And what I am seeing um, a tremendous amount of right now is there's a lot of lenders that are offering down payment assistance programs, right? For some time, those were almost unheard of. Right. But it seems they're, they're trying really hard to bring those back, and I think Part of that is to hopefully encourage buyers to to take the plunge with the interest rates the way they are now in the hopes that in the future they can refinance. So it's almost like a no-risk situation, right, as long as mm -hmm. you can bear the payment. Who's, who's supplying the money for these down payment assistance programs for all these different lenders? It used to be that it was the state or the county. Is it still that way, or are private industry jumping in? I think it's both. Mm -hmm. um, 
And the reason I say that is because I'm getting quite a few emails, which I'm actually trying to sort through them myself as, as we speak now. There's so many of them out there. Right. And, you know, there is always um, local assistance from the cities. And then also some banks have their own hybrid programs. I'm, mm-hmm. I'm sure some of those. And it's just so much information, and it's just kind yep, of hit us really quickly. But I would, I would kind of take a step back and be cautious and make sure that you understand all of the guidelines, the requirements, and the pros and cons. Because in some of these situations, like I know that uh, you know in the past, some of the city programs are, have what is called shared equity. Yes. And shared equity cannot, you know, some for some people it may not be the best option. And um, I've noticed that a lot of the income restrictions are not as restrictive anymore. Uh, so, again, I believe because they're trying to encourage the markets to have some kind of uh, movement because, you know, obviously there hasn't been a lot of movement for some time now. Well, I read the other day that a million dollars is the new half a million dollars or whatever it is, you know, or, or the 100000 is the new 50000 or something like that. Uh, it just goes to show you that, you know, w- what is considered high pay or low pay really changes depending on, you know, who you're talking to. And obviously it's gotten really much more expensive, so you need a lot more money to do whatever you want to do. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, you know, times are just changing. Everything is changing. Right. Traditional jobs are changing, you know, the eight to five jobs. I have a lot more clients now that are self-employed. Mm-hmm. So with the same thing as those down payment assistance programs, I'm seeing a lot more self-employment programs in the industry than I ever have. I mean, the self-employment seems to be the target right now where everyone is, is trying to reach out for those clients. And um, they're making them fairly easy for them to want to purchase. And you and I both know that it's kind of a unique kind of situation when you're self-employed. Yep. You have the ability to make more than an average 8 to 5 job with a salary. But at the same time, you know, you have uh, challenges when it comes to showing your tax returns and showing your net versus your growth. So there are plenty of programs out there to help those types of clients. You know, you you talk about some of the uh, difficulties with these types of programs. I look at AI as as a real problem for our industry in as much as if there's less documentation or different documentation needed on certain types of loans can be easily or manipulated through AI uh, and the different ways that both signatures and background and all kinds of different ways that loan and loan employment and money is checked currently. Um, does that worry you? Well, it absolutely does because, again, you and I come from this industry for many years now right. where things and checks and balances were were absolutely necessary and there wasn't anything um, that would ever have in our beginning careers would have been accepted as an e-signature, right? Right. What signatures right. were absolutely required and now we're to a point now where, you know, you have e-signatures. So how do you verify an e-signature? I, I mean, have I no don't know idea. If people think right. about that. Right. I mean, I'm just thinking about property and and uh, who owns property and what do deeds look mm-hmm. like and all these kinds of things that are really easily copied, in my opinion. Uh, and if right. if the search is not done properly or if the people who are doing the search are involved with it, it becomes a nightmare for people who get the house sold out from under them. I saw it happen a couple times in Florida, and I was like, wow, this is a, this is a real issue here. It's definitely a scary thought to right. know that we're so dependent on technology now that, um, right. you know, the checks and balances, the human checks and balances are no longer there. I mean, I can get a HELOC done in a matter of four days. Wow. I mean, I of right wow. because it's yeah it is <laughs> but think about it i i tried it i actually did try it and it did get done in four days and to me i was kind of floored because i'm thinking it was as easy as me registering the client the client receives a link the client uploads information answers questions on this link within 24 hours they receive two or three offers from the lender once they're approved 
then they send a notary out for signatures, and there you go. Your HELOC's open. Yeah, it's amazing. And, and I don't know the intricacies nor the checks and balances on the money and how it gets distributed, but I can imagine, like uh, we had so many you know, fraudulent transactions when we talked about wires over the last you know four or five years, this is going to be fraught with it as well. It just worries me. Uh, speed is not your friend in the loan business. I always say that. Uh, I think th there's a reasonable amount of time, but, but things require a reasonable amount of time. And this AI... Uh, artificial intelligence is going to eliminate a lot of that. And so you just trust it, I guess. Well, it, it's um, it's kind of a scary thing for us, I believe, because our generation is so used to black and white paper, right. wet signatures. And I truly think when, I think when it comes to something as important as real estate, that's not a small purchase. Right. And for the most part, I would say the majority of people that are buying their first home, that is going to be the biggest purchase of their life, right? Right. So to not have the security of knowing that because some technology is coming into play that's accepted in our industry, that their, their home could be sold right under them and right. they wouldn't even... That is a very scary thought. It is. Okay, I've got about a minute and a half left. I want to touch quickly on uh, this lawsuit mania uh, uh, on commissions uh, and I was talking earlier on the show about it and how it might lower costs but at the same time you may be without representation how, what, what's your view on it I'm getting a lot of conversations from realtors that I'm speaking to and, and as you know we do have a real estate office ourselves sure. of course. and the thing is that you know it's almost like they're expecting the listing agent to do two jobs yep. and get one pay. Yep. Or, or to represent both parties equally with no prejudice. How's that going to work? <laughs> That's going to be very difficult. Very. Um, very difficult. I, I have no idea how this started or why it started, but it's definitely not a good thing for consumers. It's not a good thing for the agents. It's just not a good thing. But how do we deal with it? I think it's going to it's have to be one of those situations where you know, if the sellers truly want to have proper representation, it's ultimately going to be the decision of the sellers and the listing agents as far as how those commissions are going to be distributed, right? I, I mean, agree. there's already forms in play right now where there's acknowledgement of where those commissions are going. So it, it, and I understand the lawsuit, but at the end of the day, if there's a situation that needs to be resolved, if you have amicable relationships with your um, agents and I think really that's the key the key is that when we started in this industry we built relationships mm -hmm. we actually spoke to each other we got to know who was in the industry today agents won't even call you back <laughs> no, not only that they just want to know when they're going to get paid uh, right yeah Listen, I'm up against it. Always appreciate you coming on. Great insight, and I really appreciate, you know, spending time with us once again. No, I appreciate you, Jeff. Thank you for having me. Sure. Could you uh, let people know how they might be able to get in touch with you? Absolutely. Um, Claudia Fernandez, you can reach me directly at 626-422-2017. We are in the city of Covina, 101 North Citrus, on the corner of Badillo and um, Citrus. <laughs> so you can reach us. We're happy to answer <laughs> questions or concerns you may have related to real estate. Thank you, Jeff. Thank you, Connie. Thanks very much for coming on the show. I always appreciate it. Thank you, Jeff. Sure. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. That was Connie Hernandez. She's from PMC Lending. And we'll be right back. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. We'll be right back with more in just a moment. For more information on today's topic, email Jeff Barton at info at malibufunding.net. Now, back to The Mortgage Voice with your host, Jeff Barton. Welcome back, everybody. I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for tuning into the show, for listening to us each and every week as we come to you uh, through the towers over at KCAA, San Bernardino and Riverside. Hi to everybody out there, and thank you again for listening. Uh, we are on a number of different podcasts, and those podcasts are 
<laughs> they start with an Apple, Apple Podcast, Apple a Day, uh, Google Music Play, <laughs> Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, iHeartMedia, Radio.com, YouTube, Podclips.io, and TheMortgageVoice.com. Excellent. Okay, if you want your podcasting needs filled to the fullest, go to podclips.io. Great place that you centralize all your podcasting desires, wants, and needs. There's a bunch of great people, great shows on there, ADR stuff, my show, financial stuff about mortgages. There's a health show with Josh. Uh, just, I don't know, there's a lifestyle entertainment, sports, all kinds of different things that you can go to podclips.io. Go there, podcasting needs, and... Uh, uh, I hope to see you uh, sign up. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton. This is The Mortgage Voice, and thanks very much for tuning in. Okay, so Redfin, 2024 outlook for housing and why Redfin is important. Okay, there's a lot going on in the real estate world, uh, not only just supply and demand out there in the marketplace, but there was that huge um, lawsuit in the Midwest against real estate commissions by um, – uh, the, the plaintiffs against uh, NAR and the local boards of realtors. Well, that lawsuit in those states is coming here. So if you are uh, in the market for a home, just know that as a buyer, one day you're going to be asked to pony up to pay your agent. Now, you may say, why? I never paid the agent before. I understand that. But the times, they are a changing. If the seller could get out of paying you or your agent any money, they're going to do it. That's more money in their pocket. Now, how the negotiation goes, how it's going to be worked out that you have separate representation and the the uh, seller has separate representation, but both representatives are paid equally or at least paid in some kind of fashion, which would dictate that you get representation, that's got to shake up. But these lawsuits are coming, and you're going to have to pony up something or I don't know what's going to happen. Uh, there are other options, I guess. You could represent yourself, or you could have the listing agent, the seller, represent you, or the seller's agent represent you. Now, that's not going to be the most comforting of things, knowing that your bid and offer in a multiple situation is being handled by the same person who's telling the seller who to choose in terms of the buyer and seller. However, um, as I said, I think it will work itself out, but we're going to see some reduction in prices, and that leads us to this Redfin 2024 outlook on high, on housing, and they had four different things that they wanted to talk about. They, they had a descriptive word, at least a writer had a descriptive word about what Redfin's, you know, four things are. I'll just call it four things. Home sales will pick up. Why? Okay, so rates for mortgages are falling. Right, And that only means, like, let's say rates come down to 6%. You're going to see a ton of activity out there in the marketplace. Even if house prices don't change, uh, lowering the mortgage rate to 6% or 6.5%, already you're saving a point and a half off the mortgage price. And so that's going to bring more and more activity. Uh, one, uh, as an aside, in mortgage rates. Okay, so... During the pandemic, we had some unbelievably low rates. Everybody realizes it, knows it, has forgotten exactly how, how much those rates were uh, lower than they are today. Well, let me remind you, just so that you can feel all warm and fuzzy if you didn't get one of these rates. And of course, I'm kidding. Okay, loans. Below 3%, what percentage of people have that loan? 22.9% of people have loans below 3%. That's a lot. You know, if you're talking 50, 51 million different mortgages in the country, so if you're talking 30%, what did I say here? No, 22%, yeah, that's, that's a good number of loans, below 3%. Below 4%, 60.3% of the people out there have loans below 4%. Huge number. And get this, below 5%. Now, when I had my last loan, I paid my house off, it was at 5.125%. I was ecstatic to get that loan because when I started the rate, it was at eight point, what was it, eight and a half, eight and three quarters percent, and it eventually got down to five point one two five percent. I refied it into a fifteen year, paid it off, and that's done. Okay, below five percent today, right now, eighty percent of the loans out there are below five percent, which means that in today's current market, even if you get what I just said you could get at six percent. That still means you're 1% above 80% of the other mortgages in the um, – so unless you're out there and need to move, nobody's moving. This is why the housing 
crisis is happening. Oh, and there's a bill before Senate right now, and I say Senate, before Congress, to limit hedge funds from buying single-family homes. As we all know, Arrive Homes with, I think it's Bill Gates who backs them, puts in a lot of money. They've been going around the country, as is many, many hedge funds and um, uh, big money corporations, buying up homes, renting them out. It's a good business model. So, and if anybody ever saw, what was the name of that show with Ben, ben Stein and his son? You remember the name of that show? No, I just remember the game show. Okay, no, no. Anyway, he, they, they would buy up hotels, and that was their business. They'd buy up a bunch of little hotels around the country, and they'd pull them together, and that would be what their business was on an overall. So they're trying to prevent uh, large hedge funds from doing that because it's taking mark, uh, share of housing off the market. That's a bad thing. Uh, they try to explain it away in many different ways. I've seen two or three different arguments that it doesn't affect housing uh, for single-family units at all. But, of course, if you're taking 10,000 homes off the market and never allowing them to be bought or sold again, well, what do you mean? Of course that affects somebody. <laughs> Obviously, the existing prices are artificially kept, uh, artificially the prices are kept high because you're taking products off the market it's just supply and demand that's all we talk about supply and demand anyway 80 percent below five percent wow that means that we've got to uh, build a lot more houses and a lot lower prices and that's not anyway here's what redfin says uh, home sales will pick up i just went through that one the fees will decline okay well we talked about that in the lawsuit i.e because realtors are now going to really have to figure out how to get paid one of the ways to get paid is to price yourself lower than your competition. It used to be that 5 or 6% was the norm in real estate commissions. If you can put competition back into that equation, uh, <clears throat> long story ago, uh, I had a company. It was a discount real estate company back in early 2000, 1999 to 2000. I was one of the first fee-for-services broker out there, tried to make it work, Good business plan. Uh, and then, of course, the uh, dot-com bubble burst and all the money out there to develop that kind of business went out the window. But now we come full circle. How many years later? Almost 25 years later. We've got, uh, because of these lawsuits, you're going to have competition in the marketplace for real estate commissions, which is going to lower your fee. Number three, renting will become more popular. Okay, the big units will stay expensive. Of course, this is all Redfin. Uh, in 2024 and what they say about it. Uh, the small units, however, will not be expensive because there's a ton of them, a ton of backlog, like uh, one bedroom, two small two bedroom spaces all across the US. So rentals will go down according to Redfin. And the last one, the fourth big thing, uh, boomerang migration. Now we all remember during the pandemic where People got out of town. Oh, I got to get out of town. I can't stand it here. Oh, I can remote work. I don't need to live here. Oh, it's too expensive here. I got to move. So we had a, a number of different areas that we talked to, whether it's up in the Bay Area, whether it's uh, in um, Tahoe, whether it's uh, – in the San Bernardino Riverside areas where people would go from one expensive areas and move out to something else that they could afford. It would be a better lifestyle, good for the kids, better schools, what have you. Well, we now have what they call as reverse uh, boomerang migration, which means that those people who went to all these places and drove those real estate prices up in those remote areas are now saying, what are we doing out here? We don't want to live out here, so they're going back to the city. That's boomerang migration. And why is that important? Because it's going to allow those places that used to be pretty cheap to buy in remote or rural areas to go back to those kinds of prices because the demand is gone. That's going to free up some, uh, some housing for people who can afford or can't afford more expensive. Anyway, I'm Jeff Barton, your voice in the mortgage industry. Thanks very much for coming into the show, and uh, we'll see you next time. You're listening to The Mortgage Voice with Jeff Barton. For more on today's topic, visit www.malibufunding.net. News, weather, and talk from KCAA, broadcasting to the Moreno Valley, Corona, and Riverside. It's that time of year again. No, not the holidays. Medicare open enrollment. And if you have questions about Medicare, you should talk to the local experts. Paul Barrich and Associates.